certain pattern that seems to happen. And I take a day off, and then I come back, and I do twice as much <laughs> to get caught up. No, actually, I'm always caught up. God knows what we have in store for today. I have no idea. But I do enjoy the idea that, you know, I've learned now to once a day kind of recharge my batteries, or maybe once a week. Once a day, too, in devotionals, but once a week to recharge my batteries by getting away from the computer and too much sitting because my, my back has gone out. To maybe do some other things, you know, that God would have me to treat with respect the time that sharing emotionals involve, but also the time that, as he did in creation, taking a moment of a day or taking a day to really rest and just take it easy. Typical in our society, rather than rest and just relax and maybe take a nap, read a book, chill out. <laughs> if you're like me, you spend twice as much time playing as you do and working at it as you do resting. <laughs> we'll get to it in the kingdom, I can tell you that. That's for sure. But in streams in the desert, I will be still and I will behold in my dwelling place. Isaiah 18.4 Assyria was marching against Ethiopia, the people of which are described as tall and smooth. And as the armies advance, God makes no effort to stop them. It seems as though they will be allowed to accomplish their work. He is still watching them from his dwelling place. The sun still shines on them. The rain still falls. But before the harvest, the whole of the proud army of Assyria is smitten as easily as when sprigs are cut off by the pruning hook of the husbandman when a gardener snips the vine. Is not this a marvelous conception of God being still and watching? His stillness is not acquiescence. It does not mean he accepts and doesn't participate. His silence is not consent. It doesn't mean that he's not aware and participating in what is going on. He is only biding his time and will arise in the most opportune moment and when the designs of the wicked seem on the point of success, he will cause them to be overwhelmed with disaster. As we look out on the evil of the world, as we think of the apparent success of wrongdoing, as we wince beneath the oppression of those that hate us, let us remember those marvelous words about God being still and watching. There's another side to this. Jesus beheld his disciples toiling at the oars through the stormy night and watched, though unseen, the successive steps of the anguish of Bethany when Lazarus slowly passed through the stages of mortal sickness until he succumbed and was born to the rocky tomb and died. But he was only waiting the moment when he would interpose and interject himself most effectually is it is he still to you is he distant watching waiting he is not unobservant he sees it all he is beholding all things and he has his finger on your pulse keenly sensitive to all its fluctuations he will come to save you when the precise moment has arrived you know that's something that if we recognize that god is in control then how could we say anything about anything, really? Because if God is in control, then he knows what's going on and he'll take care of it. But the question you have to ask yourself, is the creator of the universe, is God, your picture of God, your idea of God, is your concept of God big enough to handle your problems? Or do you think that your problems are small enough that God would ignore them. I don't know what kind of God you got. <laughs> I can tell you what Jesus is like. I can tell you who Jesus' Father is. I can tell you who created the universe and was so overwhelmingly blessed by it that he said it was good and that he chose to reveal to us 
his love and his desire for us to participate in creation in such a way that he would even count the hairs on your head. That kind of God I could tell you about. The God who just kind of ignores your prayers and leaves you to do your own thing and kind of lets you get stomped on and chomped on and beat up. I can't tell you about that kind of God. I can tell you what it might be. You know, maybe, maybe he got off track, you know. Maybe it's not God at all, but, you know, you might be suffering the consequences of your own actions, you know, where you said, hey, you know what, I think I'll go do this, and, you know, I'm going to step in front of a car and get run over. So you did, and he got run over, and then you asked where God was. <laughs> really? <laughs> you did? The truth is, is that there are principles that God will still be with us, but when we choose to hurt ourselves, Oh, he'll, he'll band-aid up our hurts. But he'll also say, look, when you step in front of a car, you're going to get run over. So when you're dumb enough and you're stupid enough to do the wrong thing, you're going to suffer the consequences. But in eternity, God is going to use all of these circumstances to teach you what not to do, what to do, and the reality of how he loves you, not how he beats you up. That's you doing it most of the time. Things that Satan gets credit for is such a baloney that most people don't acknowledge their own sin first before ever trying to blame it on it. The devil made me do it. I think the flesh made me do it, and you know the devil just said, ha, ha, ha. And he just laughed at you from a distance when you blamed him. Because Satan is just an angel. But our flesh, that needs to be crucified. Satan can lie to you and, you know, get you deceived to look at somebody else or something else or even himself. I mean, it might be just yourself that's causing a lot of your own pain and suffering by where you're at with God. So when you develop a closeness, you'll find that Jesus will take you all the way through your trial or your circumstance. Even when it's a gray day, you'll enjoy it anyways, in some way, in some way, through the tears or through the pain or through the suffering, you'll smile because you know the Lord is with you.